So I do see that we have about 200 plus guests who have already joined us. And uh, I would like to say a big hello to everyone. I don't want to say good evening because we have panelists and guests joining us from various time zones. And on behalf of Bird Group, I welcome each one of you. My name is Anjali Vathavan and I head corporate communication for the group. And uh, very, very welcome to you. And this webinar that we're having today, Rebuilding the Treasures of Travel, is a part of Bird Group's uh, leadership series. These were initiated, conceived, planned by Dr. Ankur Bhatia. He is someone whose vision and uh, you know his vision continues to guide us, and we want to really take his legacy forward. And this webinar is a step in that direction. It's the uh, it's not the first one, and there are a couple of more webinars also planned, which will be coming up very soon. And we're grateful to all our friends and supporters from across the globe who have been here to help us realize his vision. So without further ado, I now invite our moderator, Mrs. Rupinder Barar. We're very honored to have you with us, Mrs. Barar. She is the, audition, the additional director general, Ministry of Tourism, Government of India. Over to you, ma'am, to lead us through this webinar today. Thank you, Anjali, and thank you to uh, Radha Bhatia ji from the Bird Foundation for setting up a uh, webinar. A uh, discussion session. It could not have been, I would say, more timely because in India we've just opened tourist visas on 15th of November, and we are uh, welcoming of more than almost 18 months. So waiting for everyone to be able to travel. There is a lot of trepidation. There are there are, of course, uh, bound to be a lot of uh, issues around are we safe to travel? Are we good enough to travel? How to go with? Have there been learnings in the industry? How do we go forward, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So it's a very people who are not just making a difference in the whole sector of aviation, travel, and flying around um, the world, but also people who've been working through the last many months in ensuring very safe travel and ensuring, in fact, an improvement. And a lot of uh, conversation is going to take us through on how all these brilliant people have actually used this as an opportunity and have looked upon the adversity as a kind of a disruptor, which has led to better ways of doing businesses. So I'm not going to take a lot of time uh, on this part of it. We will get navigating, but let me introduce you very quickly as to all the people that we have and we will try and take questions at the end if I'm going to leave you with time after my questions are done with them. So with me on panel today, the first person joining in from London is Virginia Messina. Hi, Virginia. Thanks Hello. for joining us. Thank you. So, hi. So Virginia represents, as you can see, uh, just at her backdrop is the World Travel and Tourism Council, the WTTC, and she is in London today. And she has a huge experience behind her before she came on to WTTC. She's been part of the Mexican government. She's led the tourism initiatives in her country before she came to the WTTCI. And now when she's there, she's looking at a lot of public policy formulations. She handles advocacy, communications, research, digital, and the list is endless. So clearly somebody who has a hands-on experience. So thanks, Virginia, for joining us. I will come back to you with the questions. After I have introduced the panel with us today, joining you and joining us in the conversation is Make It Sheffer. Make it welcome, and yeah. um, we hope to steer yeah. high. And Mika, you are the executive vice president and the MD at Asia Pacific Amadeus and leading from the front, so to say, in terms of how travel is supposed to happen in post-COVID times. We are very excited to have you with us because you've been involved in a lot of B2C and B2B businesses for almost two decades. So lots of learnings, I'm sure, will come in from you. You've, um, I think, currently joining us in from Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. And yes. that's where you live and that's where you work for almost 17 years. And for us in Asia, I think that is a region, it's a hub. 
and a lot of aviation happens from there. So excited to hear from you as to how things are going to be now that the world is once again becoming a happy, safe place to travel. Moving from you, I am going to actually to Canada, but today to New Delhi. Uh, Ms. Shifali Juneja, very proud to introduce a fellow service officer from the IRS. And Shifali was working in the Ministry of Civil Aviation. Before that, she was um, the Revenue Service Officer handling very challenging assignments. Worked for five years in the Ministry of Civil Aviation, learning the nuts and the bolts of the industry in India before she was selected as the India representative on the Council of the ICAO. And she is mostly based out of Montreal. But today she is home, she is in New Delhi. And we are very excited to listen to what all she has been doing because I know she's been doing a lot of work around the council recovery task force for COVID and doing a lot of work on consensus building. It's been a challenging period viewers. And so how have the different organizations actually been steering the industry in these extremely difficult, unprecedented difficult times for the industry, for travel and therefore for tourism also. So thank you Shifali for joining us. And it's um, a pleasure having you with us. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, ma'am. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, in fact, uh, thank you to the organizers for having this very, very uh, important uh, webinar today. Thanks, Shifali. And moving on uh, to Stephanie, Stephanie Siyufi. I was trying, I hope I have said it the right way. Exactly. And, uh, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for being here with us. You are in Geneva. So the good part about our panel today is people are from different regions and they'll actually be able to give you a lot of feel also about the regions and different climates. I'm sure somewhere it's colder than at other places and some places are a little warmer than the others. So we hope to actually get a feel of those places on the virtual platform too. And Stephanie, you've been working with Ita uh, in 2006 and then you moved on. You have been doing a lot of work on human resource training and the IDA training, skilling and upgrading, which is absolutely such an essential part of the trade. Not only now in post COVID time, but also how do we drive the whole industry through the human resource and trainings, not only in, um, in, in the 21st century, I think it just becomes that much more crucial on how we take this element forward. So we come back to a lot of questions uh, that will drive the industry and hope to get a lot of insight on that with you. Last but not the least, the lone man standing, as I was calling him before we started this session, amidst all the amazing, brilliant, pretty women, is um, Amber, Amber Dube. And Amber is currently in the Ministry uh, of Civil Aviation in New Delhi, representing Government of India, from a ministry that is key to travel. It manages a lot of policy and operational initiatives of the government of India as we look forward to reopening and reopening with safe and very, very sustainable solutions. Amber has been a part of the uh, KPMG earlier and Amber was also very closely associated with the drafting of the National Civil Aviation Policy, the NCAP, as we call it in India in 2016. And that's the reason he has actually been picked up to be a part of the government structure because he was so very closely associated also with another scheme which we are running in India, which is the Regional Connectivity Scheme, the RCS scheme. So because for us in India, the domestic part of travel is also a huge vertical. So thank you, Amber. And thanks for joining in and looking forward to a lot of conversation from you too. And before I um, move ahead, I think my first question, Virginia, is going to go to you. How do you see the recovery today? How do you see recovery in terms of the vaccinations that have happened around the world? Is that impacting travel? And how do you see things changing in terms of a more easy space to travel. There, there have been restrictions, there have been a lot of issues. How do you see it going forward? Absolutely. Well, thank you again. Good afternoon, good evening, and, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be representing the World Travel and Tourism Council today. Um, we basically bring together the 200 biggest businesses across the whole 
medical sector. And we've certainly been looking at this issue. I'm, I'm not going to touch on the impact of the sec uh, that the sector has had, because we know that this crisis has been absolutely devastating. But I think what is worth is to think about what our crisis, uh, what our sector brings to the economy. So in 2019, travel and tourism represented more than 10% of GDP globally and supported more than 330 million jobs. That's one in 10 jobs in the planet. So uh, again, we know out of these jobs, about 62 million were lost during 2020. And due to obviously, um, unfortunately, all the restrictions, the closure of borders that, that, that brought our sector to a halt. Now, where we are in terms of the recovery, we have seen um, some dom strong domestic activity in some markets. So overall, according to our forecast, globally, we're at about a 30%. So in 2020, we lost nearly 50% of that contribution and we've recovered by a third. Now, again, um, this has been mostly driven by domestic activity, but unfortunately, international visitor spending is still um, incredibly low. So there's regions such as Asia Pacific where international visitor spending is still 25% lower this year than it was in 2020, which was certainly the worst performing year. So when we look at Asia Pacific, for example, Again, our, our sector contributed nearly 10% of, of its economy in 2019. And we know it was the fastest growing um, region and unfortunately it was one of the most affected regions again when it looked when we look globally with more than a 54% um, drop in terms of GDP and millions of jobs um, lost. So in terms of the recovery, we are it's near, it's around the global average. So um, Asia Pacific is experiencing an, an, an almost 37% um, growth in terms of GDP. But again, it's mostly driven by, by domestic. Now, what are the things that we've been pushing for? So uh, of course, I mean, we know the lack of harmonization and coordination throughout this crisis unfortunately has been has had a huge impact and, and, and you were referring to vaccines and and, and vaccines had a, had had a an enormous impact in terms of the recovery so regions that have been able to roll out their vaccines um, at, at a higher speed have obviously seen a, a faster recovery um, and that's what we've been advocating for vaccine recognition we know there were certain, there were loads of issues in terms of the types of vaccines that were in certain countries, um, actually particularly with an Indian batch of the AstraZeneca, for example, that caused noise. And, and all of this confusion has been undermining consumer confidence, which ultimately results in, in booking. So vaccine recognition is critical. Vaccine equity, it, particularly in regions such as Asia Pacific, as they say, we're not going to be safe on until the whole um, world is safe. And that's why we've been working with organizations such as COVAX, UNICEF, to, uh, and, the, and the travel and tourism sector has been doing a lot from an airline and other perspective um, to, to try to enhance vaccine. Health and safety obviously remain a, a priority and, and, and that will continue um, to, be, to, to be the case. So these are overall the things we've been talking to governments about. Now, when we look sort of post-crisis, obviously we've been doing a lot of work on sustainability, which is unfortunately the next biggest um, crisis that our world faces. But I will leave it there. Thank you so much um, for having me. Thank you so much. I will come back to you uh, on a couple of other insights. But, uh, you know, I think what is heartening though the times have been really difficult, but domestic tourism, domestic travel has been holding on and is helping the sector to kind of stay afloat in some cases at least. And in India, of course, it's been a very important vertical for us. Also because the thought was that if the domestic travel goes good, it kind of sends a messaging that if it's good for me, it's good for you kind of a messaging. But you know, what is also of great concern to any traveler today is the entire supply chain, all the components. Am I going to get the same uh, kind of safety protocols all across? And that's where I wanted to bring uh, Mike in. Mike, how do you see the integration of the entire supply chain in terms of rebuilding travel? Because clearly there is fear. Clearly there are concerns. How do you really see that businesses need to be sensitized and actually bring into operation things that they would need to do to foster that kind of confidence in a traveler? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And I think also building on, the, I think Virginia mentioned a lot of the elements already that are important to rebuild uh, travel and to get the, that are requirements. 
we've done some research and I think uh, on regularly throughout the, this whole COVID crisis to understand really what drives the travelers, what are their concerns. And I think, uh, for example, in India, they're still the, 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 the biggest concern is that for people still to catch COVID. You know? So therefore the safety hygiene requirements are critical. But also people are worried about getting stuck somewhere. So the, the requirements of self-isolation or quarantine, and there are also changes in the regulations on a regular basis, has, has, uh, has brought down confidence for, and, and ability for people to especially travel internationally. As you say, it's been domestically picking up, but on an international basis, it's been more challenging. Um, and so uh, the requirements and the unclarity of the requirements has increased um, uh, restlessness and travelers to be able to take a trip um, and, um, and, and therefore also cancellations uh, that might take place as requirements change over time. So I think what is really essential to get travel back is, uh, is finding a way to ease some of the quarantine and testing requirements um, and to find some stability in those regulations over time so people know what they're up to when they, they undertake an international trip. Um, and so really simplifying that travel experience. You said as well, there's many elements. It's about booking a trip, it's uh, arriving at the airport, then the airline, then the hotel. And so how do we create a more frictionless experience throughout? And I think many companies have been talking about that even pre-pandemic. Um, it's ever actually become even more important now because whatever, I would say friction has increased. If you've traveled recently internationally, it is quite a complex procedure. The lines at the airport have never been longer because the check-in procedures take much longer. So it's really important to really look at where are those key friction points now in the process and how do we simplify that? In terms of digital health certificates, how do we get that into the flow of the systems that are behind a lot of the travel ecosystems? And that's also really trying to integrate approaches from, from across the world, uh, because again, not everybody will have the same solution into the existing ecosystem of IT solutions. We do also see many of the travel players, especially on the airport side, starting to do investments in, for example, biometrics to also uh, make that airport experience um, a safer one in terms of having less, less touch experience with making it more touchless and to also get the flow in the airport going more smoothly because again, a concern is having to wait um, and, and that creates the, uh, the risk exposure. So technology will be key. And that's definitely what we believe, but technology by itself won't work if we don't collaborate. It's really about collaboration across the different stakeholders, as Virginia said, and Virginia said, uh, which has been a challenge. Uh, but I do see we do see different parties coming together, um, and we're trying to really bring as well the different stakeholders there around the table to find solutions to uh, to improve the experience of travel and make it even better post COVID. Thank you, Mikhail. I think that's really an important takeaway from what you just said is the need for simplification, the need for harmonization, the need for also induction of technology, but also training the staff at the various locations and also training the traveler. I think how do you really train the both the supply side and the demand side is a question that I am going to raise to Stephanie a little later. But before that, I want to go to Shifali because the organization that she is representing India as the ICAO plays a very important role in creating integration and solutions. Shifali, how do you see the role of regulation? Because clearly there's been a huge disruption. It, in a sense, gives also an opportunity perhaps to look at things that might have not even been looked at in terms of simplifications or integrations as we go ahead. Do you see this as an opportunity? And also, how do you see policy helping to improve on the issues that Mieke has raised in terms of cross-border travel, particularly? Uh, thank you uh, very much, Rupinder. And uh, first of all, uh, let me say that this is combining the three T's, that is trade, travel, and tourism. I'm really happy to be a part of uh, this uh, important webinar. At this point of time, uh, we have seen a certain uh, green clouds in the sky and we see some revival of aviation, some recovery. And, and, and I want to make a point here, and this is basically a message from the industry, that there's tremendous resilience in aviation sector. So we have the industry partners in the International Civil Aviation Organization. They have been briefing us from time to time and helping us take, take, take forward what can be the policy initiatives in uh, the recovery. 
of aviation. So ICAO has been at the forefront from the very beginning, uh, from the time uh, when uh, this whole uh, pandemic started and uh, uh, aviation was considered one of the real vectors of uh, making it spread all over the world. So uh, our immediate reaction was to have an aviation recovery task force and to bring in a takeoff guidance. And this takeoff guidance, you know, are kind of uh, detailed facilitation measures which uh, go into considerable amount of scientific analysis that what can be the kind of, uh, you know, transmission on a flight and what can be the right way uh, that the passenger should be traveling and uh, what should the crew be doing. For the crew, uh, it is incredibly difficult for the, uh, for the crew to go through quarantine. So they, we develop what is known as the public health corridors where the crew are sanitized and uh, they don't really have to go through the quarantine processes. But in spite of doing all that, what really emerged was that we found that there is a complete kaleidoscope of uh, you know, uh, measures that different states have taken in terms of the kind of testing you have to do, the kind of vaccines you uh, that are you know recognized, some are recognized, some are not recognized, and of course uh, they are. If if you had COVID and and then you recover from COVID, then and what is the kind of uh, certification you will require before you're permitted to go for international travel? So there was a, every country was kind of experimenting and, and trying to understand what's the best way to go forward. So ICA has been uh, working very closely with the World Health Organization as well as with the I think World. Tourism organization also has been a party to our deliberations in trying to get the political will. I think this we felt was the key that was lacking. And we therefore we decided to organize a high level conference which took place last month. And the whole idea, and, and this is something that both Virginia and, and Niki have touched about, that there has to be a global, you know, uh, systematic way of reopening the aviation sector. So it cannot be, uh, you know, every the, uh, the puzzle, uh, have, uh, can, there cannot be different pieces of the puzzle. It has to be a global synchronized picture. And with this intention to get the political will, we had as many as 56 ministers from uh, 120 out of our members uh, of 193 states, 128 states attended this. And all of them said that we really want the aviation sector to now take off, to reopen in a calibrated manner and we do want to ensure that the testing and, and the related you know, uh, protocols of health records uh, are not an uh, 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 obstacle in the way. So what I call is really worked, and this is, I think, the key in the factor is that in future, for anybody to travel, health records will be a very important uh, piece of his uh, you know, uh, documents that he'll have to carry. So whether it is uh, his uh, tests uh, or whether it is his vaccinations, or whether it is the kind of, if he has already got a COVID, uh, uh, he's uh, already caught COVID and he's recovered from it. So kind of uh, protocols then uh, that he has gone through, all them, all these things will be a part of his health records. And these health records need to be digital. They need to be interoperable. So a person traveling from India goes on to US, goes on to EU or any other part of the world, this should be automatically, you know, interoperable in the digital systems. And that's the only way it, we can facilitate uh, the travel because every country is uh, very, very, you know, protective of, of uh, the kind of variants that we've seen and we see how they hit us all. So uh, this has been, I think, the key initiative uh, in trying to uh, once again revive the aviation. And of course, there have been many other factors that have uh, been looked at uh, by the civil aviation organization. Uh, it's basically from the terms of what is going to be the needs of, uh, of uh, the aviation sector once it, re it starts restarting. Will there be safety hazards? What can be the facilitation challenges? What can be the security challenges? What can be the capacity building challenges? So we're trying to look at everything uh, you know, as, uh, as things are evolving. And uh, we're trying to see that uh, uh, whenever we are ready to reopen the borders, uh, it is done in a systematic manner. And uh, the kind of uh, reaction we got, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, that every country they use whatever uh, their, uh, you know, uh, assessment was of the pandemic to go on and, and uh, you know, ensure quarantines or uh, testing protocols. I mean, there should not be so much of differentiation. There has to be a pattern which has to be followed. And this will get uh, the passengers uh, to, uh, you know, have greater faith in the systems. 
and also um, you know get them to start planning the journey once again especially if it's for tourism or if it's for trade thank you Thank you, Shifali, and I think that sounds very encouraging to know that ministers from 56 countries actually got together. You've been uh, working very closely with different countries on how to bring in a more systematic way, digitizing data so that people have a seamless journey, but also clearly still a lot of work to be done, I think. And that's why the travel has started, but in some places it is more than at the others, but largely I think the steps are still baby steps, but you know, and that's why, but we also have today's session, which is being called as rebuilding treasures of travel and loss, but now found. I think so the, I don't think we could have had a better title to today's session because yes, world is coming back, but then also coming back with a lot of uh, that. Moving from there, and uh, Guru Stephanie on that, you've been uh, with ITA leading since January 2019. And soon after that, I think you've been given the huge challenge of moving into a very different kind of a training space, right? But I was reading your um, CV, your bio, which says with your energy and enthusiasm, and I love those both those words, and say that you are on a mission to create the innovative and flexible platform of ongoing you know, uh, learning industry needs. And uh, believe you me, I think you need all your energy and enthusiasm, right? Because never has there been a better chance to, to innovate. So how are you looking at the whole thing as an opportunity to innovate and also trying and create a lot of um, stress that would be created both for the supply side also because there's a lot of learning that's suddenly required and a lot of recalibration that would be required and there are obviously concerns on both sides how do you see handling it and how do you see it forward from here thank you very much and, and i'm very happy to be here so good morning afternoon evening to to everyone i've been listening to um uh, the other panelists and and actually this is the same thing that that uh, that I'm going to say, but from a human resources perspective, I believe that with this crisis, I'm not uh, uh, going to tell you, you don't know, but we've been staying quite isolated. Huh? Some families have been separated for a long time and several aviation organizations in our industry had to apply unprecedented measures like laying off massively their employees during the crisis. This has created a high level of stress and uncertainty. But what we've seen after the shock is that people starting to look into other options and re reorient themselves. And even now, we even see as the industry restart an opposite trend emerging. The shortage of skills is actually knocking our doors, huh? believe it or not. But while it was mainly focused in the US, as we were saying, some domestic traffic uh, has been uh, helping this restart earlier than others. They were facing that before, uh, I would say, uh, other regions, but now all the regions are facing it. So the topic of shortage of, research, uh, of resource was actually back in the time by large announced before the crisis. But now it comes back. So what we did as an uh, industry association, we're trying now to understand what are those skills, the critical skills in need for our industry. And we look at all functions needed uh, to operate a safe, secure, and sustainable industry, as Sheffield was saying. And to that end, we've been creating a new aeronautical skills working group. And our mandate is actually to help uh, the industry regrow by determining and reaching alignment on the most critical skills. We've been identifying a number of, uh, of problem statements, like resources planning. So highlighting the challenges that the HR leaders are facing now in properly forecasting P for people. Flight operations related issues like recency requirements, regulators flexibility, the loss of experienced uh, uh, personnel. In ground ops, such as in maintenance and tech ops as well, we see uh, also the need to, uh, to, to have more harmonization of mutual recognition, the need of digital competencies, 
but also there is a lack of attractiveness. This is a global concern. Uh, we are really failing at attracting talent in our industry because of what happened. It's an uncertain uh, place to, to, to work. So we are gathering now, right now, some information, and we will most likely run a survey next year to really understand what are those best practices that people have been putting in place and also see how and if we can do something at a global level to support this capacity building in, in this historical restart. So now, now, what do we need to do? It is true that it is absolutely great to see our industry restart. And we dare even being more optimistic at our annual general meeting held in Boston in October, we described it as a cautious optimism. Why? Because we do face several challenges. We need to team up, as uh, uh, the other panelists said, in order to fix it. I don't know how many of you have been traveling and experiencing what uh, Mickey was saying earlier, but we do literally spend hours in checking and rechecking regulatory requirements, doing PCR, date to date at, and whatsoever uh, tests that we can think of. We want to be sure that we have our papers in our hand. Okay. So the very first thing, as Mickey was saying, we need to simplify the process. At IATA, we've been creating this IATA Travel Pass. This is very much to support, uh, as much as we can, the resolution of that complexity that arose from the, uh, the pandemic. The whole idea here is to enable passengers to check and prove their meet COVID re regulations uh, before arriving at the airport to uh, limit actually this queuing effect that, uh, that we're having there. So immediately, as Sheffield was saying, it is true that we want to simplify the process, but still maintain this number one priority that we have all in mind, which is the safety. We are very highly regulated uh, industry and, uh, and uh, we absolutely want to maintain that safety. So we are creating as well courses around the safety culture because we're gonna be onboarding new joiners, people who have never been working in this industry. So they need to understand what the safety uh, culture is that we, we know when we're working in this. And maybe I would end with the future. Uh, that is ahead of us with this great priority on sustainability uh, at the last uh, AGM, so annual general meeting, a resolution was passed uh, by IATA member airlines committing them to achieving net zero carbon emissions from their operations by 2050. This pledge brings air transport into line with the objectives of the Paris Agreement to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. The net zero objective will be met through a number of factors. One of them will be the use of sustainable aviation fuel. Okay. And that will require collaboration, as you can imagine, among all stakeholders who will be involved in making that happen. So again, what we're trying to do in, in terms of reskilling and building up capacity for the industry, we want to enable this collaboration and we are developing things and courses to actually uh, bring this knowledge to the whole value chain uh, so that people involved can make this happen. Okay, from investors to airlines, airport one handlers, everybody has something to do, including the young generation uh, who wants to be part of uh, of this uh, this challenge? So yes, I would say that there is a great place for education within our industry, uh, as we can build the future of aviation to be better for and with our kids. If you look at that, the leaders who will fly the the SAF, the sustainable aviation fly, uh, fuel, um, will. Uh, uh, they are 15 years old right now. Huh? So we want them to understand they can be part of this uh, historical restart where they can design the aviation they want to, to fly with. Stephanie, I pick in two, you know, words, um, two phrases, cautious optimism and a restart kind of a thing. And, and yes, I think you are handling one of the toughest parts, I would say, of the whole thing because handling human resource and going through unprecedented crisis that all of us perhaps living today have not really been a part of the last mega crisis that the world faced was when World War II happened. And I think most of us weren't even there then. And um, handling this kind of a crisis is something that our generation probably has not really witnessed uh, in this scale and magnitude, which has literally touched every corner of the world. And while in a sense the world has become flat and the world has become a smaller place with all the connectivity, but that itself became a challenge because something that we were all assuming to be so much a part of our life just came to a standstill. And the sector that I represent here, tourism, 
tourism just cannot happen without travel. So there's been a lot of talk of virtual experiences and all, but we all understand that there's nothing like going and actually experiencing a place, going and living there, meeting the people there, having the food the way you want to have it in local places. So we are, of course, looking forward to the revival, but clearly challenges remain and a lot of homework cut out for all of us, which brings me to our um, uh, you know, representative from the Ministry of Civil Aviation in India, who is handling a very significant part of work in the ministry. As I said earlier, he's been part of the drafting of the aviation policy in India. And today in the ministry, he's handling the IT part of it, the information technology, drones and skill development, all three very crucial areas of work. And before we move to the drones, in fact, I'm going to ask Amber that Amber domestic tourism has picked up in a reasonably big way. We can say we are able to fly fairly safely. Of course, there have been queues at the airports. It has been a bit of a harrowing experience because it's been different airports, different uh, requirements. The personnel at the airport is sometimes not really uh, aware enough and everybody's scared. And so therefore, the fear factor is sometimes pushing us to be over cautious. And there have been, of course, many memes and jokes and all kinds of things uh, happening also on that. But in India, and India integrating along with India travel with the rest of the world, how do you see it going forward? And how do you see technology really entering into our airports and making sure that now that we've opened to the world on 15th of November, how do we make sure that we don't have those cues and people actually entering and going back to their homes uh, with a feeling that they had a fairly safe experience? Thank you so much, uh, Rupinder. I think these are very interesting questions. A series of questions, so I'll take some time to answer these. But before I start, uh, I just want to say how honored I feel uh, to be part of this group. Of course, I'm the odd man out. And I actually begged and cajoled Radha ma'am to <laughs> let me be more a part of audience uh, and uh, and applaud rather than uh, be part of the group. But then you know Radha ma'am, the tigress that she is. When she says you show up, you show up. So no questions asked. So thank you so much. And uh, uh, also before I start, a, a big tribute uh, to uh, uh, the women in aviation, I think uh, they're playing a huge role, uh, like in healthcare and uh, banking and telecommunications and so on, media and so many industries which are actually dominated uh, by, by women. And uh, even in our ministry, uh, uh, like in tourism, uh, some of our biggest decision makers are uh, Usha Ji and uh, Rubina and Garima and before that Vandana. And Shefali Ji was also part of us earlier. She's still part of us, uh, but now handling a much bigger role in uh, Montreal. So it's all women part. And uh, it's also symptomatic of what is happening in the aviation industry also, where uh, heavily, heavily dominated uh, by ladies and so much. Uh, we are so much fortunate for that. Coming back uh, to the uh, pandemic issues. Yes, of course, once in a hundred year uh, phenomenon, but as uh, many of our illustrious uh, leaders uh, on the panel said earlier, uh, uh, Aviation people are a tough nut to crack. I mean, uh, we, we, uh, we are the most vulnerable in terms of pandemics and epidemics and volcanic eruption somewhere in Iceland and that uh, disrupts schedules all over, uh, diseases, I mean, wars. You name a problem and we are the most sensitive because uh, aviation is one of the first things to be shut down in case of any risk uh, to human, uh, uh, to passengers and to uh, assets. So, but uh, the, the beauty is uh, that we always bounce back. And that's why none of us uh, who are on the panel uh, ever regret being in aviation or tourism because uh, uh, we always know that we've chosen the right uh, line and the right profession. And every time uh, we are pushed, uh, as they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And we out of this pandemic, I'm so proud uh, and with all my fellow panelists that we're very proud that we've come out of it okay uh, the war's still not uh, over and yes uh, we are in that last mile uh, but all indications uh, uh, show that uh, the third or the fourth wave uh, either will not come or even if it comes it will be almost like uh, non-noticeable even in india uh, as you know uh, we've crossed almost 110 crore uh, people 1.1 billion people that's almost one and a half times the population of entire europe and uh, maybe three times that of uh, US uh, with all our uh, challenges and poverty and lack of medical infrastructure, uh, we've reached that 1.1 billion mark. The, uh, the number of uh, uh, the, the infections and the people who are uh, down with COVID is a very, very small number 
as compared to the 1.4 billion population that we have. So it's been a great success. Of, of, uh, often India doesn't get the sort of attention uh, it deserves, but uh, frankly, it doesn't really matter. We are we're doing what we had to do. Now we coming uh, now coming back to the aviation part and tourism part. Uh, very heartening uh, to note uh, that we've almost touched about 85, 90 uh, percent on the domestic side. International, of course, is a challenge, and I'm sure, uh, as Rupinder Mayam also said, uh, we will be opening up very soon, and that will see a surge of people because I mean, Indians, uh, every fifth person on the planet is an Indian, so uh, we are spread all over the world. Uh, whether it's a, a low-income uh, worker in uh, the Middle East or uh, other parts, or the high-end uh, Sundar Pichais and Nadellas in uh, in the U.S., I mean, all of us need to connect back to our families. Uh, most have not met each other for almost one and a half, two years. Uh, so uh, we expect like a huge and a massive surge uh, of uh, revenge travel and revenge tourism. People just need to get out of their homes. Even if it's like in the same city, people are, we are noticing people are stepping out of their homes and going to a hotel in the same city just to spend the weekend and come back home. Just, just to get that, that little mental health uh, uh, issue sorted out because all of us are sick and tired of uh, being sitting at home. Now we in the government, of course, uh, we've been working all through the last two years, as I say, the military, the police, the health, system and the government system never shuts down. So we've been going to office every day. I travel 32 kilometers from my home in uh, Gurgaon to Delhi and come back. Uh, of course, there were a lot of people who are very scared with what we do, but then we do what we do. And we're still alive and kicking on this this, this panel. Uh, 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 Rupinder Man spoke about technology. Uh, now that I would say is one of the biggest achievements of this, uh, uh, this COVID pandemic, as I say, uh, what has to happen will happen, but uh, every calamity is an opportunity and uh, smart people always uh, convert that, that into an opportunity. So we tried our best. Uh, and uh, uh, if you see lot, lots of things which we were planning for decades and talking about contactless travel and paperless travel and this and that and online working, so on and so forth, we were mostly discussing and discussing budgets and all that, but one pandemic and it's all gone. So now you, there's no stamping of the, the boarding passes. A lot of that is now online. Uh, they were tagging all the bags. So much uh, has been taken out uh, in the name of uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, we'll only become more and more contactless and paperless uh, as you travel for. Yes, ma'am, you're, you're right that, that uh, at the airports. Now, see, uh, when we went down, we, we had to reduce people because you know, unfortunately we had to let go of people. But then now all that is being brought back. And... Uh, Yes, uh, with the sudden surge that we've seen, uh, uh, because our uh, festival season starts in October, and uh, we've seen an unprecedented surge, in fact, far beyond what whatever we were projecting. So yes, there is some congestion at the airports, and uh, we're trying to figure that out by, by getting more automation, more mechanization, and more people being pumped into it. Uh, at the same time, we're also building, uh, expanding our airport infrastructure, the, the airlines, we despite this pandemic, uh, there are uh, uh, there's a new airline Akasa Air, and just two days back at Dubai Air Show, they have just ordered another, I think, 70, 72 uh, aircraft order. Okay, and the current ones, the big ones like the Indigos, uh, etc., are already expanding. And uh, Air India has also been sold out a national airline, and Tata's have have purchased it. So them, so all these are green shoots, which tell you that these are very very hard nosed professionals and uh, with eye on the ball. Uh, everything's based on cash flows and projected cash flows. So they're not going to invest, set up new airlines, expand capacity and buy out a government airline uh, unless they see a value. I'm also the vice chancellor of our National Aviation University. We're seeing no uh, reduction in people who are interested in uh, aviation. Uh, right next to our university is the largest flying academy called Igrua, Indira Gandhi Rashti Ulan Academy. That academy is also seeing unprecedented interest. So all over we see uh, that... Uh, Everybody understands that this, this little blip, okay, once in a century kind of an event, but it's just a once in a century kind of an event. But education is forever. Uh, uh, epidemics are for a short time uh, and uh, uh, education is forever. So just like Stephanie was mentioning earlier, uh, uh, we have to focus a lot on skill building and education because uh, the quality of professionals, I mean, we've done whatever we did and now we have to hand over the reins to our next generation and they have to be absolutely top quality. So. Uh, a lot of focus uh, in India, especially we are giving on technology and uh, skill development. Rupinder? Thank you. Thank you, Amber. I think that was a very, uh, you know, quite a comprehensive overview of things, the way they are evolving. And I'm, uh, you know, looking at my watch and happy to see that I still have uh, time for a quick round of uh, a conversation with all of you. And I'm going to go back, therefore, to Virginia to ask you, Virginia, that I know that WTTCI, in fact, started doing a lot of research at the outset when the pandemic happened. And as we've heard our panelists today, there is a lot of role of communication as we are finding air travel picking back. 
what kind of change do you see? And especially because what Stephanie has touched is a very significant point of the message of sustainability. And there has been a conference very recently on climate change and the need to adapt uh, to uh, carbon neutral technologies, aviation fuel. Of course, that's a very different subject. We don't have so much time today to touch on it in detail. But how do you see communication changing in the post COVID? And how do you see it as an opportunity, in fact, for us to use it as a fresh reminder on how we need to craft travel as we go forward in this century? Sure, that's a great question. And, and as we say, with every crisis comes opportunity, right? And, and I think, I mean, what are the opportunities we see arising from this crisis? First of all, I think there's an element of the appreciation of travel and tourism, because uh, again, as we've been saying, people have been in lockdown, have not been able to travel um, for work, but also that means they haven't been able to reach their families, their friends, and that has had a huge social impact, as Stephanie was, was explaining from a human um, perspective. So, so there's an appreciation in the sense that travel and tourism is not just what the economic um, impact I was talking about, but also it, it means much more in terms of the livelihoods, in terms of the communities, even in terms of the wildlife and biodiversity. I mean, we've been in conversations with African parks that are really struggling now because of the lack of tourism. So I think in a way there's been Sort of an element of appreciation then i mean some of the colleagues here talked about um technology we're certainly leapfrogging when we're when we're looking at border processes i mean we, we've been hearing about different solutions such as the ayata travel pass and, and many others that are around and i think really these type of solutions will help us as we emerge from from this crisis because we know travel will pick up but we need these processes to be seamless and to be efficient and we know from a government perspective I mean, we need to prioritize health. We need to avoid the spread. So if there are technologies um, or solutions that will be able to prove a, a, a passenger's um, COVID um, um, status via a digital tool, obviously that will help us have a seamless experience, which is what everyone's looking at. And then there is the element of, of sustainability. This sort of enhanced sense of wanting to travel for the good, wanting to make sure that when we travel, we're having a positive impact, we're consuming local, we're impacting the whole supply chain in a positive way. And it's not only happening, obviously, at the policy level, we've just seen the big conference um, happen in Glasgow, actually, we were, we were, we took part of that, but it's also the consumer level. So, so I think um, there is an enhanced sense of, of doing the right thing. And there's a number of efforts now from, for example, all the big OTAs such as Google, Booking.com, now really being to, to show what a sustainable choice is, how to make sure that we're making these choices. And, and from, the, from the private sector perspective, we actually launched a, a, a big um, roadmap for, for the sector. So again, what does it mean for a sector to be net zero by 2050? We're a very diverse sector. I mean, Stephanie was touching on aviation and the importance of, of sustainable aviation fuel. But throughout our sector, if we think about accommodation, if we think about tour operators, it's so diverse um, that we really that need a, a very specific approach. So we are providing a framework and, and some recommendations and also identifying, of course, what the challenges are, but hopefully um, we need um, more will to go into that from both the, the public sector as well as the private sector to, to achieve this. So that's what I would highlight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. And we came very quickly to you. Uh, there is an opportunity in adversity and there is a lot of digital and helping to scale up businesses as we go forward because there is a lot of ground to be made. So there is opportunity here, but how do we scale it up? Sorry, I couldn't fully um, uh, hear, hear your question, but well, I, I... Yeah, I'm just going to uh, spell that again, and uh, that how do you see in times to come technology helping businesses to scale their operations, especially to make up the lost time that the last 18 months have been so disrupting? Yeah, so we see businesses across the value chain of travel investing in technology. There's a big focus initially on automation, uh, because again, especially when in the beginning, when all the cancellations happened, it was clear that the process of changing tickets, reissuing, uh, putting credit in there was not a, an automated process. So there's been a lot of investments from across the industry 
to, to automate that. And that will be better for the future. No, it will enable travelers to make their own changes. It will give people access. Um, there's also a lot of investment that's happening, as we've talked about the digital health certificate. And right now that is COVID. But I think uh, there's other elements of health certification, vaccination that uh, was required prior to COVID. And also, especially we see the opportunity for more digitalization of identification, but their uh, documentation, uh, because that can also simplify the process. It's been always a very manual process. Um, and uh, with the acceleration investments in technology to digitalize right now the vaccination test certificates, that technology can also enable the identification process throughout the whole travel experience. And the last but not least, it's really also about getting information to travelers. Uh, travelers right now are scrambling to get information. People want to have that information at their, at their fingertips. Um, and that information needs to be dynamic. No, it, it, it just changes all the time. Um, so it's really bringing that to, to travelers. And what really lies underneath all of that is an investment in personalization. Um, and NDC, for example, is one of those key investments in the aviation area uh, where people were a bit worried with COVID if that would slow down. But actually, we've seen acceleration and adoption. People are taking the opportunity, especially on the airline side, but also on the travel agency side, to make those investments right now to be ready when the recovery comes to really have the latest technology to really make those personalized offers and solutions and retailing solutions towards the travelers, really to make the travel experience better. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for enabling me to share here also our perspective and uh, for the invitation. I think we have a few technology issues, uh, but I think we'll go through there from here. Challenges of technology on my end. I was going to say technology <laughs> challenges are everywhere still. It's not smoothless, so, but again, we test and learn. I'm sorry, I lost you for a minute. On Zoom, I think that's the learning. But uh, going forward to Shifali at that point, I'm going to ask you, Shifali, that with so much of digital documentation happening and the world actually moving ahead, how do you really see the solution to that? Do you really see that people are going to build a global consensus in, for travelers? Because every time you land in a different jurisdiction, there, are, there is a new regulation to be read and that's half the reason why people are not traveling today because they're like when we land somewhere we really don't know what we may be confronted with how do you see the consensus building happening do you see it at all happening or not and how soon should i say do we see it happening uh thank you uh, madam Abrar. it's uh, first of all this is something i i would have highlighted in my earlier intervention uh, basically what i was looking at one vision for aviation recovery uh, it is talking in terms of something beyond the global pandemic. And what it has proposed is that what we need is a multi-layered strategy in civil aviation, which is, has to be acceptable to all. And there is also a, a very important concept here of non-discrimination, because we need to know that vaccines are still not available in all parts of the world. So there is also different thoughts as far as the scientific evidence is concerned of vaccination, of testing, of recovery from COVID, so uh, ICO has been uh, working again with the, the uh, real uh, experts here on the field, the aviation uh, medical professionals in trying to work out that what can be the best way forward. And it has said that it is important to have a, a exit strategy for every state. So it was very easy for the states to you know, lay down their rules for uh, stopping the flights, but now it's time for them to develop their strategy and how they can do is has, it has to be through risk management. So they have to have a risk management. They have to need to see that uh, what are the public health risks, how are they going to gradually in a calibrated manner open travel. They have to also look at the economics of travel. I mean, they, it is a fact that uh, travel enables trade commerce as well as you know, brings employment. So these are things that the states need to look and ICAO has been very forthright that these are completely sovereign issues of every country, but what it is looking at having one vision so that uh, uh, there is not much uh, problem when a traveler sets out 
he knows what uh, is going to be, what is going to be the grind and he's able to accordingly travel uh, plan his itinerary what i was also proposed is uh, you know encouraging the transportation of vaccines because we have to ensure that if there if there is any part of the world which is not vaccinated there's it's it's a risk to uh, the rest of the world so we have to ensure that the medical supplies essential supplies as well as vaccination uh, vaccines are uh, supply chain is constantly maintained ico has also talked about the fact that there is need to strengthen you know technical uh, uh, support to many states it has developed what is known as the ipax so uh, ipax is basically a way of uh, strengthening some states in their uh, uh, technical capability of uh, meeting with the requirements laid down by ico for enabling travel they have also tried to go on for uh, uh, supporting many states uh, based on the issues raised by them uh, ico is also stressing on what is known as an the palanist of also uh, especially amber has talked about the idea of safe contactless travel so it's important to have integrated automated uh, digitalized solutions uh, for it there is need for the new technology to be agile uh, in uh, responding to the uh, uh, the new treatment methods that are available of uh, passenger testing as we very well know that united states they have gone for antigen testing and rt pcr is not required which is like uh, one third of the cost one could say so uh, and definitely the rt rt pcr test cost uh, also are very uh, important uh, uh, part of uh, itinerary of a passenger it adds to the health uh, to the cost of the passenger so there has to be a significant component of uh, you know uh, overall look as as to what kind of the teething problems we would have when we were trying to reopen uh, aviation and uh, stephanie is very well touched upon you know uh, need for the competent aviation professionals and engagement of, of the states you know it's, and when i could talks about uh, all is one 93 member states that they need to retain uh, their existing uh, qualified professionals as well as attract more professionals into it so uh, i think it is a there is no simple way of answering how we can do it it has to be a multi sectoral effort and i think uh, we are all working towards it and uh, definitely the green shoots are already visible thank you thanks so that's a positive note that green shoots are visible but stephanie i think the role cut out for you guys that uh, retaining talent and also not only retaining but upskilling the talent in so much innovation that is expected out of the situation in terms of use of technology um, what do you see as the time graph when you feel that the staff and the people in this industry are actually going to feel comfortable about their own uh, ability to handle the crisis Mm -hmm. uh, I believe if we, if we look at, uh, if I would be an HR aviation industry leaders today, uh, I'll be facing with uh, the challenge of properly identify which skills I need. I need a set of skills right now, but uh, it's true that the air traffic has increased at uneven speed in different locations. The constantly changing rules make it increasingly difficult to plan resources. So. I would say the very first thing to, to do is for these HR leaders to really understand what they need now, now to restart, okay? And then as well to plan for future. What are the skills that will be needed? Those digital skills, this uh, data literacy type of skills that uh, we expect to see in the in the coming future. So I believe that, uh, as Shefari was saying, uh, the very first challenge is we need to find ways to attract new talents and retain our employees. And uh, I'm sure that if I would be asking the audience what innovation means to you, some will say digitalization, some others will say uh, the famous line uh, about things with different eyes so i believe that uh, the most important in terms of uh, of uh, reskilling is really to understand uh, a few things first of all we forget what we learn if we don't apply it and people who will be joining this industry now will need to be reassured that they're going to be entering a company an organization that is ongoing uh, 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 developing myself. So if I join an aviation, uh, an airline, for example, how am I going to be sure that 
continuously I'll be learning. That is the most important thing. So as an HR leaders, we need to ensure this kind of ongoing learning uh, uh, culture, so to say. So it's really about shifting from delivering a training to facilitating a learning. So I would say, if you look at uh, the first things to do will be to, to identify within our current people and existing staff, who are the ones who can actually help others, then identify this competence we need right now and the competence Competence of the future. We have one of our advisory council, which is the digital transformation one. They said, let's make sure that we're not going to fix the problem of the past by reskilling people with current skills, but also trying to identify those future ones. It is true that uh, digital competencies are needed across the board within all functions. But how to actually make that happen is by sticking to the reality of the different paths of digitalization project as the organization is going through. So I think if we have to retain one thing is that it is all about instilling this continuous learning culture. It is all about uh, uh, retaining our talent and the key to retaining the, uh, the employees will be to develop them. New technologies will emerge. Things will change. Uh, we can re we cannot really be sure which ones is going to take over uh, uh, compared to the others. But what we know is that digital transformation projects are happening as we speak. And the more we are flexible and agile in the way we are uh, uh, providing development opportunities to our uh, employees, the best would it be. So this will support the success of digital transformation pro projects, and and because the employees would understand why we implement change and how they contribute. Thank you, Stephanie. I think that uh, a conversation with all of you is already creating a lot of hope in somebody like me when I'm listening to you. And I'm sure to everybody else that there is a lot of clarity on strategy. There is a lot of clarity on the way forward and things are happening. So I think that should lead us to a more confident future. And uh, with Amber, I am, I'm not sure whether I am asking you a question which is relevant to today's conversation, but I can't resist because I saw in your profile that you're having drones. How do you see drones making a difference in the new frontiers as we go forward? Thank you so much, uh, Rupinder. Uh, drones is the future of aviation. So, I mean, you'll be surprised if, uh, I won't be surprised if 10 years down the line in a Lufthansa plane or a British Airways plane, you actually struggle to find the pilot because the pilot might be actually on the ground or maybe in an underground bunker somewhere. Oh, so that's it's the future. Happening there, is it? It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Yeah. It started with a military aircraft, uh, lots of F-16s and lots of, I mean, some of the projects we can't speak about, but uh, even on the fighter jet side, it's already in uh, process. And uh, if you know, uh, notice in space travel, uh, these unmanned uh, aircraft have been going uh, to the space, to moon, to faraway planets without any uh, human being on board. So this is not something new. And uh, uh, the same thing will gradually come into the commercial side. Of course, first we'll uh, start with just simply surveillance. And uh, ag in agriculture, we see a lot of use, especially in our country, where there's a lot of uh, manual spraying. And uh, our Honorable Prime Minister is extremely, extremely, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, determined to wipe that out. And uh, drones gives us uh, that opportunity to completely do away with manual spraying because that's very bad for your skin, for your eyes, for your lungs. And because of poverty or whatever, I mean, because of lack of affordability, many farmers end up doing that. And that's not good for their health. And uh, drones give us that opportunity where the farmer could just sit in, uh, the drones could do his job, uh, maybe 100, 200, or three meters, 300 meters away from him and do a very even spray. There's also precision agriculture where the drones can uh, take the pictures of the leaf uh, color and they break down the green into maybe a million hues of green and they give you very precise advice of how much urea or potash or uh, DAP or, or any insecticide, VD side or a pesticide that you have to put in what quantity. So you actually end up using exactly this quantity which is required rather than just spraying the same amount uh, uh, all over the place and, and wasting money and water and other uh, resources. And then there's mining uh, where you do uh, so much of uh, that uh, uh, the coal stack, uh, the, uh, uh, what do you say, mine production, uh, the volumetric assessments can be done in a few hours, which normally take days to audit. I can just go on and on search and rescue law and order. Even in the COVID times, uh, uh, police uh, authorities all across the country in India used uh, drones to do the surveillance uh, 
and to warn people and announcements so what i've seen that in wuhan and other parts of china also the same thing happening then on uh, uh, last year around uh, may june in rajasthan we had the locust attack uh, which came from the pakistan side and this typically the, the swarms come every year but the super swarms come once in 30 years the last one was 1993 and uh, uh, last year uh, it was the worst attack in 27 years uh, where we had uh, a drone uh, uh, sorry a locust swarm uh, as wide as 30 kilometers can you believe it it's like a black cloud engulfing you an entire uh, fields were could have been wiped out and that too during covid first wave when many of the people in rajasthan had their sons and daughters coming back from the big cities having lost their jobs because of covid and on top of that came this import of uh, locus and uh, we had to put in everything the ground vehicles the helicopters and drones and drones could do things where the ground vehicles couldn't go in ravines and some of the low lying areas or uh, areas where uh, the ground vehicles couldn't go or on tree tops or very specific places where you could do pinpointed uh, spraying uh, using drones because helicopters are overall spray ground machines have uh, are limited by the terrain so uh, drones could do that works i can just go on and on and spend the next one hour but i'll stop here just to say that uh, drones are the new mobiles and mobiles we use just for like i'm doing a video conference here in op location outside the uh, my ministry and uh, you can just call and whatsapp and uh, download stuff on the internet drones will be mobiles plus plus okay plus maybe some 100 other things that you can draw do with the drones yeah, you can even take a you can even take a selfie i'm sorry you can even take a, a selfie will become a delphi and uh, even your 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 phone will become a drone uh, it will have uh, one click of a button and some four arms will open up and the small uh, propellers and batteries and it will fly and uh, while you do the voice commands you can start uh, clicking photographs uh, and move on and have a good time so and uh, just uh, take another 30 seconds uh, just about uh, in the august last three four months have been very very active on the drone policy front we had a policy in march uh, which was uh, repealed Uh, based on a big ta- public backlash that we got from academia and from industry from startups even honorable prime minister uh, did pull us up saying it was uh, too tough on the security and the safety angle so uh, we have repealed that and in august end we have come up with a new drone policy which makes it very very simple uh, the uh, the uh, i'm sorry we're just getting too many phone calls <laughs> actually i just stepped out of uh, the aviation secretary's uh, uh, pan india secretary's conference anyway so uh, cutting a long story short uh, So we come up with the new drone rules, which have made it very, very simple. No permissions required up to 400 feet uh, for 85% of Indian uh, airspace. Uh, normally, it was about 30, 35 was green. Now it's become 85% up to 400 feet. No permission required. Some 25 forms have been reduced to five forms. 72 types of fees have been reduced to four types of fees, and that to some one, one and a half dollars. So it's it's a uh, uh, lots of things have uh, have happened. No paucity of time. We'll we'll stop here. But suffice it to say, drones will be the new mobiles. Rupendra, over to you. Fantastic, fantastic. So I think I need to go back and read some of my Isaac Asimov stories as to where are we headed for <laughs> in times to come. But, you know, on a lighter note, I hope the passenger flights are not going to go on uh, without the pilots because I thought the pilots are the most handsome of the guys always. So you don't want to do a flight without a handsome pilot, right? But uh, no, you'll have handsome pilots, but F, uh, you, absolutely. You'll have handsome okay. pilots, but they'll be on the ground. They'll be on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> all right so we say bye to them and go in the sky it's fair enough so thank you so much uh, to all the panelists it's been a most engaging and an extremely useful conversation unfortunately we are short on time and one would have loved to talk more as i said for me for representing tourism it is absolutely essential that a very uh, happy seamless harmonized travel starts happening not just domestic but also internationally we are waiting with finger toes body cross that travel starts really really soon and i can see a lot of effort being put by all of you to ensure that so i am going to thank all of you virginia meke shifali stephanie ambar and of course at this note i am also going to bring in the chairperson of the bird group the towering personality of travel and tourism in india radha bhatia ji because we need to have her have the last word on this one she is an amazing woman for anyone who doesn't know her well read about her and read the lovely books that she's been writing i have one on lassies from her it's how you do the the indian buttermilk as we call it and she's given it so many colors and forms and it's amazing so radha ji can we have you for the last word in
Thank you, Rupinder. And I would like to thank all the panelists. I think we have overshot the time by about 12 to 15 minutes. All of you are so passionate to bring in more technology, more tourist, more hospitality, and more automation. And you can't forget the human resource. They say necessity is the mother of invention. And COVID has taught us new ways how we are going to have the new world. Whatever was lost in the last two and a half years has to be gained. There have been a lot of job losses, unemployment, travel, tourism, hospitality, and aviation are all interlinked. If one sector goes down, the others will automatically go down. Most important is aviation. And I think all panelists agree to this and they are working on the same strive. I recollect 50 years back when there was everything manual, even the manifest could not be sent on, um, what, what, what do you call, you forget about these uh, automations, but telexes. And sometimes the manifest was supposed to be hand carried by the pilot. And I have seen in the last 50 years, radical changes happening. And I will not be surprised what Amber said, that your iPhone can be converted into a drone. The younger generation have a lot of vision and a lot of exposure to the technology. And I'm sure some of these dreams of ours may come true, but we have to guide them and control them. You know, I was in a bad patch and one day I got a dream my son, Dr. Ankur Bhatia, told me, Mom, why have you stopped your leadership summits? Why don't you start with that? And I thought there would be nobody better than all my friends who are at the panel to take that dream forward. He was one of the stalwarts of the aviation industry, of the hospitality industry. He was like a spokesman. And today we are all together to fulfill his dreams. This panel discussion and this event would not have been successful without a proper moderator and nobody else could moderate this session better than Mrs. Rupinder Barar. Can we all have a good clapping for her? Because being a revenue services officer, I think her DNA is tourism. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Stephanie, of course I know for the last five, six years, and we have done uh, IATA partnership training and many things together. Thank you, Stephanie. Mickey. Thank you very much, Shada. Thank you. You have been a great woman leader of Amadeus, and I'm sure this session would give you some more ideas to implement and to bring the technology into a better framework. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here today.
Ali, who has been always a supporter for the women in aviation, India chapter, while she was Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Civil Aviation. With her immense knowledge and also her passion, she landed up in Ikao. And from there also, she's giving a lot of support. And she is the first woman to reach Ikao as an India representative. Three chairs for the women power is here. Thank you, Radhaji. Thank you for, your, for this uh, platform. It's a, it's a beautiful concept. Thank you so much. In fact, it was so difficult to time out from Montreal to Singapore. And fortunately, Mrs. Juneja is here. So we can match. I think our friend from WTTC has already left because she was in another meeting. WTTC has been working relentlessly to bring in more destinations, more tourism and guiding all of us. And last but not the least, the chivalrous person <laughs> told, what am I going to do between so many women? I said, there is always a man behind every woman. And I know he's the man who has changed a lot of things in the government as well as in the private sector. I think he is born to give a lot of inspirations and new dimension to the civil aviation. Thank you, Amber. Last but not the least, my team, Anjali, Raki, Anil, Rohit, thank you very much because this time I have not been working so much. If there are any mistakes, please pardon. We are going to do a series more because the airlines, the airports, the hospitality sector, the tourism sector, they all have to be aligned together. So we will be working and in case you have any suggestions, I will be glad to accept them. With this, I would say, I also thank all the people who have joined in and have got, gathered valuable inputs out of this discussion. Thank you very much all the guests who have registered. The remaining can also see it because I have got some um, SMSs to say, please send us the Facebook, the Instagram contact so that we have not been able to register and I would like to go through it. Thank you everybody. And that comes to an end. Thank you, everyone, and have a good Thank evening. You. Bye. Good end of day. Bye bye. 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 bye.